excited uh, to be here. Uh, I think yeah, the last time I was giving this talk was in 2017. I think that was my job talk. So uh, yes, a refresher would be good. Uh, so yeah, so as Mark said, uh, I'm pretty excited about kind of the intersection of robot learning and human-robot interaction. And a lot of the work that we are doing in the lab is focused on that intersection and how we could learn from various sources of human data, how we could build systems that can better interact, coordinate, and collaborate with, with the humans. Um, a major part of this talk today is a little focused on the robot learning side of things, uh, but I do have like kind of like these connections of how we could learn from humans and how we could think about humans in the loop as, as we go through the talk. So, so today I want to talk a little bit about interactive learning and specifically how we should think about that in the age of large pre-trained models, foundation models. And, and to just get started, I figured it would be a good idea to start with, a, um, with an example, and I just realized I have audio for this. And I, the audio might not work, but let me, let me just kind of like set the system up. So this is a system that we are developing in the lab. It's called Vocal Sandbox. A uh, number of students are working on this. Savir, who's here, is actually like contributing to this work. Uh, Jen, Sid, a bunch of different people are thinking about how we could build a system that could actually effectively learn from humans. So this definitely has the human component. And then actually be able to like generalize to new scenarios and be able to do new motions or be able to do to, to generalize to new objects and so on. So so I just wanted to show this more as a motivation for how we are thinking about this. Okay, can you grab that pink mug and hand it to me? This is Sid giving instructions. I apologize. I do not think I can succeed at the instruction to grab the pink mug. Okay. Um to grasp. One, two, three. Got it. OK, I think I can execute on grab the pink mug and similar instructions in the future. All right, um, let's run it back. So the hope is that the robot kind of understands the key points that the human is showing here for grasping and actually like, be able to like, execute on that, like a grass primitive. And the hope is that it would generalize, right? Like, like just because I picked it up um, doesn't mean that we believe the robot. That makes this a little bit harder. All right, um, let's try that again. Starting execution now. So we would like the robot to still figure out where those key points are, right? Like generalize some new motions, like actually go to like new places, and be able to like do this task. And hey, Doris, I'm all trying. Can I ask a question? Okay. So I noticed that it grasps the bug from the same side as the human demonstrated. Okay, um, that's pretty good. Side. Um, let's reset and mm -hmm. let's let me try again. Let me, this is like five seconds. I'll that's get that. Out of curiosity, are the images on your screen also marks that I should be able to pick up? Uh, yeah, so, so, so a couple things here. Yeah, so you're absolutely right that it goes to the same place that the human is showing. So the thing that the robot is learning here is actually the key point, like the grasping key point. And then it, it kind of like calls like all the possible graphs around that key point and it goes there. We could also learn the full motion, right? Like we could actually like look at that human video and try to like figure out what that motion is. We are not doing that here. This is actually like simplified. But ideally, we would want this robot to be able to generalize the new motions, generalize the new objects, kind of like recognize what is going on in the scene and have like a better interaction and learning from, from the human. So, so this was more of a motivation example. Um, if I have time, I'll come back to this video towards the end of the talk. But I do want you guys to think about this as, as we go throughout, uh, through the talk, because a lot of ideas that I'm talking about today could be used in this system, in this we'll call sandbox system. So I'm going to talk about pre-training, large pre-trained models. And you could imagine using those models for either outputting robot actions or for getting kind of like the semantics of what is going on in this scene, like figuring out these are mugs or figuring out what are the right features to pay attention to. And I'm also like going to talk a little bit about data and what type of data we should collect. And again, that's a good idea to come, like, think back about the system uh, as we are going through these different topics. So the major part of this talk today is going to be about the fact that today we have foundation models, right, like large language models. And, and it's pretty exciting that we have access to like, these, these large models. They have been revolutionary in a lot of fields, like natural language processing, computer vision. 
And it is exciting to think about what that actually means for robotics. And then just to get on the same page, let's define what a foundation model is. So the, the way I'm defining foundation models is that we have a model that has access to large amounts of diverse data, internet scale diverse data, like text, images, speech, structured data, and so on. And what I would like to do is I would like to pre-train some sort of representation from that data. So once I can take that representation, I could actually adapt that for many different downstream tasks. Right? I would like to take that and I would like to do things like in NLP, I would like to do things like question answering or sentiment analysis or instruction following. And if you think about the field of natural language processing, each one of these downstream tasks were basically like a research thesis or a research problem on its own for the longest. And the thing that foundation models really enabled is now we could do like all of them with a single model and the fact that we have access to large amounts of data, we have a large model that could be adapted to do any of these. So, so that is pretty exciting, right? Like for, at least like for the field of NLP, that is pretty exciting. And now the question is, well, now that they are a thing, large language models, it's an example of a foundation model. What does that actually mean for, for robotics? And I do think there are two different takes here. So one take is maybe we should do the same thing for robotics. Like what does it take to do the same thing for robotics? What does it take to build something that resembles a foundation model for robotics? What is the input? What is the output? How should we go about that? And, and that is a very grand view of things. I think that's a very exciting view of things. Um, but that's only one take. Like that's only like one way of looking at the problem. And the, and maybe we should talk about that, that, that one take for a second, and I'll talk about the second take in a little bit too. But let's first talk about this, this, this take. Like, what does that mean? So that means that I would like to have many different data sources, again, internet scale data sources. These data could come from humans, right? Like they could be human videos. We have a lot of human videos of humans doing various types of tasks on YouTube, and, and it would be really wonderful to be able to tap into that type of data. Uh, we might have some amount of robot interaction data. You might be asking, where does that come from? Um, I'll talk about data in a little bit. We have natural language. Maybe we have a lot of simulation data. We could actually simulate robots, and that simulation data is also really powerful. And then we could take all of this data, and ideally we would like to pre-train some representation. I think it's a good question to ask what that pre-training objective should be. And then we would like to, again, adapt that to many different downstream tasks. And I think in robotics, like, we get bogged down with imitation or with control a lot of times. Like, we think the thing that only matters at the end of the day is, like, the, the, the control or the motion of the robot. But there are actually, like, many different downstream tasks that we should care about in robotics, too, right? Like, for example, you might want to be better grounded or figure out what are the affordances of an object or uh, what, the, what is the intent of the human. So there are actually many different downstream tasks that we might care about in robotics. And I think it's useful to think about that adaptation question for these different types of downstream tasks in robotics. So, so today what my plan is, I'm going to talk about a bunch of works that kind of fall into this category of pre-training uh, foundation models for robotics, or pre-training large models that resemble a foundation model for robotics. So I'm, going to, I'm going to cover a little bit of work around that. Actually, the most of the talk is going to be on that. And then I have kind of like a second part of the talk which I probably won't have time to get into details. But for the second part of the talk, that's the second take. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we could leverage existing foundation models, like large language models or vision language models, for robotics. So, so the idea of this kind of like second part is to not go and do pre-training and build this giant model and giant amount of data, but to just like use ChatGPT in creative ways for robotics, and I think there are quite a bit of opportunities in terms of how we should think about LLMs and VLMs in this space of robotics, and I'll kind of like touch upon some of them for this second bit of the talk, okay? All right, so let's just jump into it. So this is, if this is the diagram that I have, I have data, I have pre-training, I have adaptation. Um, what I could start thinking about is about that pre-training objective. So let's say that, let's for a second assume we have data. Let's say data is not our problem. Let's say we have collected some amount of data going back to the YouTube human videos uh, of humans doing various types of tasks. And I think a good question to ask is, what should the pre-training objective be? And then what is it that I'm trying to learn with this large pre-trained model? 
And that kind of like brings us to the prior work. Like, like what do prior work do when they have access to human videos? And then oftentimes prior work try to learn visual representations. So I have, I have videos, I have data of the, of the form of images. And the one thing I could do is I could go ahead and try to learn some sort of visual representation from those images. And those visual representations could be useful for downstream tasks. And the thing is, if you look at the field of vision and what are kind of the, the two, the, the, the representations uh, that, that exist, the visual representations that exist in the field of vision that people often use, they kind of fall into, into two extremes. So we have one extreme, which is using things of the form of mask autoencoding. And then these types of models, what do they do? They take an image, they mask it out, and then they try to encode that and decode that and reconstruct that image. So you, so you take your full-on image, you mask it out, and you reconstruct it. And, and this idea of mask autoencoding, it's pretty popular in computer vision. It turns out that it's actually very useful for robotics as well. Uh, and the reason it is useful for robotics is it captures a lot of local and spatial features. So for example, if I'm looking at picking up this, this mobile phone, right? Like I actually need to know the edges of this and I need to know the details of like this, this object. And using mask autoencoding, I would be able to like get these local spatial features. So using these types of representations, I'll have some hope that that policy that I'll train later with this representation would be able to pick up the phone because I'll get the details of, of what is going on with my, with my object. So, so that's pretty exciting, right? I get a lot of local spatial features. I could do pixel reconstruction. I could figure out these detailed patterns that can help me do things like grasping. But there is a problem with this one extreme. And the problem here is that the, the, these types of features, they kind of lack semantics. So imagine that you want to Imagine that you want to like pour milk out of a jar. Right, so let's say I have a jar of milk, I want to pour milk. And then let's say that you have a jar of orange juice and you also want to pour out of that. If you were to treat these problems and the representations using mask autoencoding, you would actually treat those two tasks differently. Because a pixel of milk is white and a pixel of an orange juice is orange and they look very different. So you're going to like redo all the work and not realize that pouring liquid is pouring liquid. You, you wouldn't be able to like kind of like capture the semantics that goes into pouring, the act of pouring and the fact that the two are similar. <laughs> so, so these types of models, they lack semantics. And then that kind of brings us to another extreme. And this extreme is things like clip, right? Like, like if you look at kind of like pre-trained representations that try to align language with, with images, we get things that, that capture semantics, right? If you look at clip representations, they, they, they try to ensure that you understand pouring, the act of pouring is similar to other acts of pouring. And, and, and you get more aligned representations in terms of your image and, and your language, which is wonderful. Uh, but the way they do that is often using, by using contrastive learning. So, so, so the way that you usually like, get at that is, is you have this contrastive objective that allows you to use language supervision and then learn concepts across images. Uh, but the problem with the contrastive objective is it's going to destroy all your local and spatial features. So, so the, the moment you're using that contrastive objective, that clip feature, you're going to lose all those details that, that you actually cared about. So going back to the act of like picking up, right? Like you could try to like think about picking up and the act of picking up, but given that you're losing all the features, like you're going to struggle with like things like actually grasping the object. Like this type of motion, which did not pick up the item, but like just generally like this type of motion is pretty similar to like actually picking up the item. And, and it seems like the right thing from a clip perspective, but it's actually not going to be doing the robotics tasks that we care about. So, so that, and because of that, like things like CLIP or things like R3M, basically like these models that are trying to capture semantics, they wouldn't really be able to like do the downstream robotics tasks that we care about. So kind of like being motivated by the fact that the existing representations, they're not grounded and they're coming from, again from the field of vision, but they're not really thinking about the robotics objective that we have. What we decided to do was we decided to close this gap and then we introduced this model um, called Voltron, and what Voltron is trying to do is it is trying to basically combine the two worlds a little bit together to get both syntax and semantics. So what we are thinking about is that great reconstruction allows me to reconstruct the image, captioning being an objective allows me to actually like think about semantics, so maybe to get the best of both worlds we could have grounded reconstruction, 
that we could start with reconstruction, but then we should maybe like think about language as another supervision to think about the semantics of the task. And, and at this point, you might be asking, well, is that it? Right? Like, did, we, did we solve this? Like, is this? Is this all we need in robotics? Is this all we need like in a, in a visual representation when we are thinking about robotics tasks or robot learning tasks? And the answer is probably not. This is this kind of like a first attempt. Uh, if you just like kind of like look at this, you might realize there are, there are a bunch of other things that we have not like modeled, things like dynamics, right? So if you think about any type of robotics task, it's not just about syntax and semantics. We have, we have motion, we have dynamics, we have the world changing, we have, we have dynamic interactions. And, and if you're an NLP person, maybe you can kind of like squeeze your eyes and think of that as pragmatics. I don't know if how, how, how well that analogy works, but you, you could really like think of like more things that are important in that representation to be useful for, for robotics tasks. And then this brings me to, to the model that we trained, like Voltron, which is, which is a language-driven representation learning model that is the first attempt that tries to get the syntax and semantics and a little bit of an understanding of dynamics, this multi-frame changes that we see in the environment. So, so we are trying to get almost like three things in that representation and hope that that representation could actually be useful for downstream robotics tasks. So this is work that Sid Karam Chetty actually led with a collaboration with a lot of people uh, with TRI. And um, as I mentioned, the key idea is use language to shape the representations and to ground the representations. So just to get into some details of what Voltron does, it really starts with like a mask autoencoding backbone. So the usual thing where you start with an image and then you do pixel reconstruction, right? Like, like that usual thing of you're encoding this, decoding this, wonderful, you have your, your, your image patches. But then in addition to that, we are going to condition our encoder on the language, right? So we're going to have a captioning loss. So if you look at this image, this is an image of peeling a carrot with a peeler. And I'm going to have a language annotation for that. So I'm kind of assuming my data set is annotated with language. So, so you've got to have some assumptions about your data. And by doing so, by, by having like this captioning loss, in addition to the mask autoencoding loss, together we are marrying like syntax and semantics and you're trying to get the best of those two worlds. But that's not enough, right? Like I mentioned, context matters, dynamics matters. So to really, to really like try to like get the context, what we are doing is instead of passing in a single frame, you're passing in multiple frames. So you're passing in a future frame in addition to our initial frame. Uh, you could pass in the full video. It's just going to be more expensive to train that model and kind of like deal with the challenges of training the model. That is why we are just only passing two frames. Um, but you could really think of the act of peeling the carrot with a peeler to be something that really depends on two frames, not just a single frame. Um, and, and that is why we are passing in multiple frames to capture the, the, the world model, the dynamics that goes on here. And then finally, the last component that, that this Voltron model has is, is a language generation component. So not only we are captioning language and we are passing in multiple frames, what we would like to do is we would also like to be able to generate the language that goes into like, describing like, the changes in this image. So again, peeling the carrot with a peeler. So basically, the loss function when you're training this is, is again, mask autoencoding backbone, so the reconstruction loss. But in addition to that, we have a language captioning loss, we have a language generation loss, and then we have kind of like this multi-frame conditioning component that goes into the model. Okay? All right, so kind of combining all three of this, we are going to have a model. We should train it on something. The question is, what is that thing? I promised we have data. We don't really have data, but imagine that we have data. The data that we decided to train this on were human videos. So we started with this some, something something data set, uh, which is a data set of egocentric view of humans doing various types of tasks, like peeling a carrot with a peeler. There's a much larger data set called Ego4D, uh, which is very messy. And, and in the second version of Ultron, we've actually trained on a subset of Ego4D and a bunch of other data sets that, are avail that have been available since then. Um, and, and training on large amounts of human videos under these three different objectives gives us a model that could actually be used and fine-tuned for various types of downstream tasks. So if you remember, the point of that foundation model was not to just do one thing. The point was you're doing a pre-training objective so that you have a representation that could actually be fine-tuned for many different things. So what are those many different things? And as I mentioned earlier, maybe imitation learning, like single task imitation, 
uh, single task imitation is, is something that we care about, right? Like maybe we really care about the robot just picking up the phone or doing the task. Or maybe we care about the, ta uh, the robot to do instruction following. So I would give like a high level language instruction. Remember the vocal sandbox example where Sid was like, hey, you should pick up, pick up the cup, right? So, so you might give like a high level instruction and expect the robot to actually like follow that. But there are other things that we care about, like figuring out what affordances are, right? Like doing some sort of like referring expression grounding, figuring out what the intent of the human is. And each one of these different tasks could fall in at a different part of the, the spectrum of syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Because as I mentioned, like, so like, the, like syntax, semantics, and pragmatics are at least like some of the things that we care about in robotics tasks. So, so, so like for example, if you're thinking about grasp affordances, maybe it is not really a pragmatics thing. Maybe it is more about really like the syntax and the details of, 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 of the image. So, so that's why I'm putting that closer to like the syntax uh, spectrum of where our robotics tasks fall on. So, so we decided to kind of like define this taxonomy of tasks and take this Voltron representation and fine tune it on, on these different types of downstream tasks. And I'm gonna show a couple of examples here, so I'm not gonna show everything. Um, like as an example, we looked at language conditioned imitation learning where uh, we are looking at tasks like shut the drawer, throw the bag of chips away. So these are the different types of instructions that a Franco robot arm is given and it acts in this environment. So it's a real robot that's trying to follow these instructions. Um, we are given 20 demonstrations. So again, remember the Voltron representation, it's just a visual representation. It's not a policy. It's not gonna output actions, right? It's just going to give you some visual representation. And then you're gonna use that representation to actually generate a policy. So, so we are giving this, this model 20 different, or we are giving our policy 20 different demonstrations, and we are running the Voltron representation. As you can see in orange, that is Voltron representation. Uh, and we are kind of like outputting what the policy would do if I were to use Voltron representation as opposed to other things like, I don't think that I have clip here, but like clip would actually like be worse. Uh, but you could look at R3M, which is pretty similar because it's using that contrastive objective that captures uh, semantics, but kind of like destroys the, the syntax. And then we are also comparing with mask visual pre-training that is similar to using mask autoencoding, which is kind of like the opposite. It, it destroys semantics, but captures syntax. And, and as you can see, like the Voltron models, again, the reason I have three of them is the first one is just doing conditioning, uh, the captioning, the second one is doing conditioning on two frames, and the darkest orange is using all three of those objectives, language generation, language captioning, and conditioning on two frames. And all three of these models outperform like the R3M model or the MVP model or other types of visual representations that don't really think about grounding. I think another interesting point here that I want to mention is more of a qualitative example. So, so I mentioned imitation is not the only thing we care about. And I think one of the exciting results here is uh, thinking about intent inference, right? So what I could do is I could pass in a video of a human doing a task, a video that this robot has not seen uh, or has, this model has not seen. So, 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 so this is a video of a person like opening uh, a faucet, uh, grasping a faucet and opening it. And what I could do is I could ask the Voltron model when the faucet is being grasped. And actually with high probability, like my Voltron model is predicting the human intent of, 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 the, of the kind of like uh, faucet being grasped. And, and that's pretty exciting because zero shot, again, with no like fine tuning or anything of that form, the model is able to capture the concept of grasping uh, by just being trained on a bunch of human videos. And I think the more exciting thing is it doesn't need to be a human video. I can pass in a robot video. And this model has not seen any robot videos. But if I pass in a robot video, again, the Voltron model is able to predict when the faucet is being grasped, uh, which I think is also like pretty, pretty cool that we could, we could use the model in very interesting, creative ways beyond just using for control or imitation learning. Uh, so this is open source. You could pip install Voltron Robotics. Please give it a try. We have a new version of it actually recently released, the Voltron X model, trained on more data. Uh, and give us feedback. So uh, we'd be, yeah, I'm curious what you guys think about it. Anywhere you're calling ResNet, you could call Voltron. So uh, that is how you should use it. So anywhere you're calling a pre-trained visual representation, potentially you should be able to use Voltron. And it would be more grounded for robotics tasks that you might be interested in. All right. So just to summarize like what I've talked about so far, is the, the key takeaway really is that in practice, we are interested 
in tapping into large scale internet scale data in the same way that large pre-trained models in NLP or vision kind of like do the same thing, right? Like we would like to tap into human videos and from those human videos, we would like to be able to capture representations that are useful for robotics tasks. And I'm not claiming that's a foundation model, but that resembles something of the form of a foundation model. Where in this particular case, we are, we are, we are proposing Voltron, which uses language and multi-frame conditioning. And together with language and multi-frame conditioning, we would be able to learn grounded visual representations. So going back to this picture, like, like this is really the piece that I've talked about, right? Like you pre-train a representation, you could fine tune it on many different tasks. And, and that sounds great and wonderful um, and kind of like useful. But I didn't really talk about data. So what I would like to do for kind of like the rest of my 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I would like to talk a little bit about data and how we should think about data going forward and what is good data. Um, and, and I talked about human videos, but in practice, human videos are pretty limited. So, so we ideally would like to tap into things of the form of robot interactions. We would like to collect robotics data. And again and again, we see lots of lots of efforts, uh, recent efforts that are trying to like crea create large robot data sets, gather large robot data sets, and pre-train models on these robot data sets. Uh, so this is a project called OpenX Embodiment. So uh, or our, there's a model called RTX. Uh, and the idea of this project was to bring together roboticists from different institutions. So I think like there was 21 institutions. Uh, and, and the idea was for folks to come together and put all their data sets together so we can have like a single place where we have a lot of robot data, cross embodiment robot data. We are already collecting this robot data in our labs, so why not like put it all together and then train a single model on that data? Uh, so this project was really led by folks at Google, uh, but again, a number of labs are contributing to this. We contributed to this. Actually, Yu Chen contributed his, uh, her Hydra data set uh, to, to, to this data set. Um, and, and it is pretty exciting to, to be able to train a single model on this giant cross embodiment um, data, data set. And, and the model's not great, but the fact that we could, we, could, we could have a model and then we could fine tune it for many different tasks, I think that is, that is actually like pretty exciting. Another effort that I want to mention is um, a particular effort on large scale in the wild robot data collection. This is a recent effort called Droid. Uh, this was also one of those efforts where we have a number of labs coming together, collecting data, robot specific data, to be able to um, do in the wild types of tasks. So this was again like a project where a number of institutions contributed. I think, yeah, 13 institutions contributed. Um, and, and this is not, this is, the, the way this is different from OpenX embodiment is OpenX embodiment, it's cross embodiment. I already collected my Franco data or I already collected my KUKA data and I'm just like adding that to a single place. But the idea of Droid is for everyone to have the same platform. This is a platform, a robot Franco, a Franco arm uh, with the same type of gripper, with the same like cameras. And then the idea is to take the robot, the same robot, so not cross embodiment, but take the robot outside of the lab in the wild and really try to like collect data, like diverse data uh, of the form of diverse motions and diverse tasks and camera views and, and so on. And, and, and this was a pretty exciting, exciting project because it allowed us to collect somewhat like not cross embodiment crazy, but somewhat like more aligned data sets that have a lot of diversity that could actually like help us train large models on these types of data. Um, here's actually like a video of one of the students collecting data in their dorm. So I think this is EVGR. I think a lot of data looks like this because people took it to EVGR and all EVGR apartments look alike. Um, but uh, basically this is uh, us like thinking about teleoperating the robot and unloading a dishwasher and thinking about uh, again, in the wild types of tasks and collecting large amounts of data within, in this setting. Yes, yeah. Is that way too nice to be EVGR? Is that not EVGR? <laughs> I've, ke I've kept saying this is EVGR. Is this not EVGR? No. Is it Mumford? It's a dorm. I'm pretty sure it's a dorm. And I thought EVGR is the nicest. No. Mumford is Mumford. Okay, Mumford. Okay, Mumford. Okay, Mumford. Okay, Mumford. Okay, Mumford. Okay, Mumford. This is Mumford. But you know, a lot of our data looks like this, I think. So, so, so a lot of like, data from uh, the different grad dorms. 
Um, and once you collect the data, right, like there's a question of like, what are you training on that? Like, how are you actually going to use that? So, so the first property of this data set is that it is extremely diverse. So if you look at kind of like the coverage of types of tasks that you're seeing on Droid, uh, compared to like other existing data sets that are out there, like Bridge, or if you look at RT1, which is this data set that was from Google, like the amount, like number of tasks that you're seeing on this data set, the coverage is quite a bit. So lots of lots of data, that's wonderful, right? Like, and, and again, outside of the lab data, so, so, so that's all great. But, but how do we go about training on, on, on this type of data? Um, and and in, in practice, what you could do is you could take the data and you could do whatever you want with it. You could train a Voltron model on it. But in this particular case, what we wanted to do was we wanted to actually train a policy, right? Like something that actually outputs actions on this data. And that is probably not gonna be that great in a zero shot manner on a bunch of tasks that we care about. So, so we actually need to do some level of fine tuning on, on that. So, so what I'm showing in these plots uh, is that we are collecting some amount of data on a particular task. So for example, the task is close the waffle maker. And if I collect that data in, in domain data, um, I'm going to have the green line as kind of like the performance of using, using that particular data. I think actually the plot I'm showing is the OOD setting version of it too, so maybe it's not exactly data from exactly the same setting, but, but in a similar setting. And you're seeing kind of like the performance of how your policy is going to act in this, in this particular setting. And then we have two other lines here, and these two other lines are going to be a co two sets of co-training ones. So one thing you could do is you could take 50% of the data for what you have collected in, in this particular setting, and 50% of data coming from the OpenX embodiment data set that I mentioned earlier, that giant cross embodiment data set that folks at Google kind of like helped create, or you could use your Droid data set. And again, your Droid data set is focused on manipulation tasks, more in the wild, much more diverse than RTX. And then the idea here is that, well, if you're using either one of them, OXE or, or Droid, you're going to see like fairly higher performance uh, than just using in-domain tasks. We would start to see better generalization. And I think that is actually the exciting part of it because, because of the fact that these types of models can tap into large amount of offline data, they should be able to generalize to things like distractors or generalize to new settings that we haven't seen before. And we kind of like see a similar trend throughout, so this is the averaged out plot. Um, and, and the other, I think, interesting point from this plot is, is, is the fact that um, we, uh, using Droid particularly, and the diversity of Droid particularly, is allowing us to have a much better performance than using the RTX or OpenX embodiment data set where we have like this cross embodiment thing. But in, in practice, like thinking about adaptation and fine tuning is a pretty important problem. Actually these plots are, some of them are generated by Joey who is kind of like contributing to this project and thinking about fine tuning and co different types of co-training like paradigms and recipes. Um, and I think, yeah, in, in general, there's quite a bit of work that could be done and built on top of this Droid data set, which I think is going to be released some, sometime soon. Um, so this work is under uh, submission right now, but, and again, it's a giant collaboration with a number of labs. Uh, but I think, like, I encourage you guys to think about ways of using this Droid data set, thinking about adaptation, fine tuning, and thinking about data quality as, as, we, as we go about building and pre-training these models. So, so that was a very quick thing about the fact that we need data. And I don't think I need to like argue too hard to say we need to collect large scale robot data. That is a missing piece when we think about pre-training large models for robotics. But I do think there are a number of other questions that are worth asking here. So sure, I can go and collect my data. I could go crazy and, and have like Droid and RTX and all of these different models. But a good question to ask is, what type of data is actually useful? Right? Like, and how should I go after data collection? Like, what sort of instructions should I give the students or, or the people who are collecting this data to, 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 to take, like when they take the robot not to EVGR, to Munger? Um, and, and, and what should we tell them like when, when we say, hey, collect data? Did nothing and just tell them, go crazy? Or should we kind of like guide them to give us useful data? And what does useful even mean? So I think so far we have treated diversity as useful, right? I showed that earlier plot showing that Droid is really diverse. But I think a very fair question for you to ask is, does that matter that it is diverse? Is that a good thing? Why is it a good thing that it is diverse? 
And I think we need to th think about data quality a little more carefully. So for the next five minutes, I want to take a side a little bit and talk about this idea of usefulness a little bit. Not necessarily in the context of large models, but more generally in the context of robot learning, maybe for small models that I would train in my lab that is feasible to be trained in my lab. So, so let's talk about usefulness a little bit, and then we'll bring it back up afterwards. So what does, what does useful data mean? And this brings me to, to a project where we started exploring, again, this idea of usefulness Kind of accidentally, honestly. So, 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 so the idea was we had this robo-mimic task that you might be familiar with. Um, and all we wanted to do was we wanted to, we wanted to do actually some interactive imitation learning work uh, where in this task you're picking up this square and you're placing it on a peg. And that's all you want to do. You want to collect some data. You want to train a model. Again, not foundation model, nothing like that. You collect 20 demonstrations on this. And you want to see how well you would do on these 20 demonstrations. And Kanishk here, he was doing a rotation with us. So Kanishk was like, this should be like, doable enough during a rotation thing. So let me collect some data. And uh, he collected some data, and he got a policy that was 14% successful. And we thought, OK, that's fine. We collected a little bit of data, how bad that, is, that could be. And, and Sid decided to help Kanishk in his project. So Sid came along, and I was like, let me collect more data for you. And, and he collected more data. These are real rollouts that people collected. So this is rollouts of Sid's data. And we added SIDS data in, and the performance went down <laughs> to 7%. Uh, we were very confused by this. We thought, oh, maybe SID is really bad at this task, and he's not telling us. Uh, but then we looked at the videos, and we're like, he's doing it right. right? Like, Success-wise, like, both of these videos are doing the task correctly. You're actually like placing the square on a, on a peg. And the question is, like, what is going wrong here? Like, like why is it that once add, you're adding more useful, good data, performance goes down? And the thing that is happening here is something that, like, in the hindsight is obvious, which is I'm passing in data from two people, and they're doing the task differently. Specifically, it might be hard to see that they're doing it differently, but specifically the thing that is different is when they turn the square in terms of when they're placing it, is different across the two sets of demonstrations. And that multimodality alone kind of like messes up the policy, because you don't know which one to do. Now you're confused about, like, should I, when should I turn my square? And, and that causes a bunch of issues. So, so for example, like if you look at Kanish collecting data, so Kanish could collect a bunch of data, and then he could collect more data. And when you look at Kanish's data with respect to his own data, um, you're going to have a plot of novelty and likelihood. And his data points fall in somewhere here. And, and the places that they fall in is that he might give data of the same form. So in terms of novelty, it might be low. But in terms of likelihood, it has Kanishk's style. Or he might give data in very novel scenarios. But still, in terms of likelihood, it is similar to how he would be doing it. And the moment we add in Sid's data, things start to change. Like a bunch of his data falls into this category. And what is this category? This is a category where he's giving us not very novel data. It's actually scenarios that Kanishka has already explored. And he's doing it differently. So in terms of likelihood, it's also low. So if you look at this region of low likelihood, low novelty, that is the thing that messes up our policy. And, and that is the thing that kind of like is a problem that we need to fix. So if you show this to any machine learning person, they would be like, well, duh, there's a multimodality thing here, ha happening here. You should have an expressive model that captures the multimodality. Use a diffusion policy, right? Like use something that captures multimodality. Use like a Gaussian, uh, multimodal Gaussian process or something of that form. Um, and just give it enough data and be really expressive. Yeah, you have this problem. Um, but a more pragmatic view of this is, at the end of the day, the only thing I care about is for the, pe uh, for the square to be placed on the peg. And I don't really care about all possible ways of doing it. I don't really care about like, capturing all the possible multimodalities. So a very simple, silly thing that I could do is that I could look at what part of data is low likelihood and low novelty. I'm going to call that incompatible data with my existing data set. And I could just throw that out, right? So I could, I could just say, well, Sid gave me data. He spent some time. But let me just like, throw out that data, because that data is not very useful for what I'm doing. 
and, and we actually like, decided to do this on uh, this RoboMimic data set where it's actually like a data set of people doing that, the same type of task that I showed earlier. There's a base operator that gives some data, and the performance of policy is like 38%. And what happens is that when operator one comes in and you collect all their data, um, your success goes up to 54%. So your operator one is actually pretty good. Your success goes up. But the thing is, if you filter out their incompatible demonstrations, you could actually make your success rate to go even higher. So you could actually like filter out the incompatible data. And I think the more interesting thing is that you could, you could see the same thing, the same trend across a number of other tasks. But I think the more interesting thing here is that you might have operators that are not very good at doing the task. So in this case, I have operator four, who is not an expert in this task. And when they give data, again, performance goes down. So originally, my, data, my policy was 38% successful. Operator four comes in and gives data. It goes down to 27. What one thing I could do is I could realize what is incompatible, and I could throw that out, and that actually brings my performance back up to what it was before. So I think this idea, again, is not capturing multimodality. It is not trying to be multimodal in any ways. But it, it does help us to kind of like recover a policy under limited restrictions that we have in robotics, not infinite data, not infinite model size, and then be able to kind of like take, take a more pragmatic view towards doing this task which I think is simple, but is very useful. You might also want to do something else on top of this. So Sid is already trying to like help us here and give us data, right? Like, like, we, like he's, he's not trying to hurt us. He's like really trying to be helpful here. And the fact that he's spending time, like maybe I should get him to spend that time on more useful things. So one thing we could do is we could kind of guide him to give us less incompatible data and more data that is kind of like aligned in terms of likelihood to what we are after. So we decided to do this using like a very simple interface. So going back to the human-robot interaction side of things, right? there's a human here, and that human is not the human that is interacting with the robot or the robot is helpful for them. The human here is the human who's giving us data, and that human is trying to be helpful. So one thing we could do is we could have a very simple user interface where the interface turned green when you're in distribution, giving good data, and the interface can simply turn red when you're out of distribution, giving like the, these types of like low novelty, low, low likelihood type of data. And that very simple interface increases performance by quite a bit. So, Again, super simple idea, but this is one of the examples that I really like. So this is a setting where we are looking at placing an egg on a, on a, on a plate. And if you look at what naive like, data collection looks like, performance is around 30%. Okay? So like I collect data, performance is around 30%. But if I do the informed approach, if I do the guided approach and guide my teleoperators to give me good data, I could actually increase performance to 85% with the same budget. And, and, and again, like I do think like this, is, this is a very exciting idea because data, like oftentimes we treat data as this passive thing that is handed to us. But in practice, it's not handed to us. Like we spend a lot of time collecting that using Droid. Or uh, like, like these companies, for example, like often have contractors who are like professional gamers who are collecting data for the company. And, and what we could do is we could actually guide the data collection to increase the performance significantly. And I think that is, that is actually pretty exciting. So let me kind of like wrap up my thoughts around this idea of data collection and data quality. So, so very briefly, right, like we talked about data quality a little bit here, like, like guiding data collection. And data quality, it's not just about diversity. You might think it is about diversity. You might think about state diversity as a really useful thing for high quality data. Because sure, like if you look at like human videos or human tra trajectories of doing the task, they're going to have quite a bit of like state diversity, and that helps because if we go out of distribution, we have a coverage of these states and we can help get, get the robot back in distribution. And if you think about scripted data, scripted data is like super clean and doesn't have as much state diversity. And because of that, if I go slightly out of distribution, I'm going to have trouble like getting back in distribution. So definitely state diversity is a useful thing to optimize. But the second thing that is important is actions, right? Like action consistency. And again, if you compare scripted data, data versus teleoperated data, 
like if you look at scripted data, scripted, scripted data has a, a very high action consistency. All the actions are funneling towards doing the same thing. But on the other hand, like human data, right? Like human data is all over the place when it comes to the actions. Like you might be in the same state and you might do very different actions. And that inconsistency in the actions is actually hurting your model because it introduces a lot of multimodality, potentially unnecessary multimodality that we need to deal with. So we talked about one way of fixing that, guiding data collection. Another way of fixing that is kind of like after the fact. You could collect your data and then you could realize like what the different modes of your data, for example, uh, when you are in kind of like a reaching mode, uh, sparse mode versus when you're in a dense mode of actually like placing the square on a peg. And one thing you could do is you could actually like go back in your data and do action relabeling and ma make your actions more consistent in some of these sparse modes. So, so this work is Hydra, actually Yushin has been contributing to this and Sunil. And, and, and in, the, in this work basically, the idea is that you could ask humans to come in and label these modes, which is a much simpler thing to do. You could potentially autonomously like, like, um, label the modes as well, but then you could go back and do this action relabeling. And that allows you to get like, more like bang for your buck, uh, and, and, and allows you to like, really like, be able to leverage your data more effectively and, and, and make your actions more consistent. So just looking at a couple of examples here, we could look at like, very long horizon tasks of like, making coffee. Uh, this is a long horizon task that has various steps. So picking up the pot, inserting the pot, closing the lid, picking up the mug, placing the mug, pressing the button. So you have like, all these different stages of this long horizon task. And considering this long horizon task, when you're doing action relabeling using Hydra, like we would be able to actually keep the performance like fairly high throughout all these different stages, as opposed to using things like BCRNN or another baseline Viola that very quickly goes down because we go out of distribution. We don't really know what to do in those scenarios. So Hydra, in some sense, it's an algorithm that is guided by data quality, guided by the fact that consistent actions are better than not consistent actions. Um, and you could kind of like see a similar trend on other types of like long horizon tasks, uh, which, which is actually pretty exciting. All right, so let me try to wrap up. I know I have two minutes. So, so kind of like the key takeaway here is that when you're thinking about pre-training these large models, we need to collect a large amount of robot data. That is for sure true. Like I think it's a good idea to collect large amounts of data. But the data it doesn't need to come passively. We could actually think about data quality and we could think about guiding data collection towards useful types of data, maybe action consistent ones, or maybe diverse states, right? But, but, but this, this data that is actually useful, right? Like it, it is both about the motion and it's also about the environment. So you could think about the visual environment, but you could also think about your actions and the motion and how that motion is consistent. Or you could like take that data and like algorithmically go and make better use of that data. Uh, and we kind of like saw that in, in, in Hydra as another way of like addressing data quality. I'm going to skip a number of slides here because I was going to talk about generalization a little bit and I was talk going to talk about reinforcement learning a little bit, but I'm going to skip those and I'm going to come back to this. All right, so, so far we talked about data, we talked about foundation models, and then we talked about, we talked about pre-training foundation models and we talked about, we talked about um, adaptation. Let me just quickly mention very, like just to ra wrap up, very brief things about the second take. That, that was the first take. The first take was this idea of pre-training. It's wonderful to do pre-training. We can get a lot out of it. We could potentially get generalizations that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. But I think the second take is also interesting. And the second take is the fact that we could use existing foundation models like LLMs and VLMs in interesting ways for robotics. And you might say, well, what are those interesting ways? And we've already seen a number of works like in the past year or two that are trying to do that. So an example is SACAN from, from folks at Google where they are using a foundation model, large language model for task planning. And I think initially, like the first time I saw this work, I was very skeptical and I was like, well, was task planning the thing that we had trouble? Like it does feel like at the end of the day, just picking up the phone, like the motion is difficult. The decision of the fact that phone needs to be picked up is not the bottleneck. So I think initially myself and a number of other people like in the field were 
very skeptical of these types of works. And, and then we saw things like CODAS policies that was trying to get a little lower level, getting large language models to output, output robot code. But that's still like limited to the primitives that you have or like what you have written in your code in your context already. And then, and, and yeah, like, like it doesn't really get at the thing that seems difficult in robotics. But I think over time, like I've actually like changed my opinion around these. And I've kind of like realized that these types of approaches open up very creative ways of thinking about robotics. I think before I wasn't thinking about code as the, as the modality that we should use in robot learning. Right? I was very much thinking about like these transformer-based models as the thing that robot learning should do. But now this like opens up a whole new direction, a whole new set of directions where you think about code output and using LLMs to generate like better and better robot code, more and more fine-grained robot code as a way of thinking about robot learning and the future of robotics. So, so I'm pretty excited about really like creative ways that we could think about using LLMs and VLMs uh, in this space of robotics. And over the past year, we have been thinking about a number of different ways of using large models, existing large models, within the scope of robotics. So we have looked at reward design and using LLMs and VLMs as success detectors, as reward functions. We have thought about using LLMs and VLMs for grounded social reasoning, physical reasoning, uh, spatial reasoning. We have thought about semantic manipulation, like referring to object parts and like manipulating items based on that. Uh, and then even like closing the loop and teaching humans, right? Generating language that helps people and teaches humans doing motor control tasks. And this last one is difficult to discuss, but this is work that Subir has done, which is more around not semantics and leveraging the semantics of LLMs and VLMs, but more about the fact that these types of models are good at identifying patterns. And you could use those patterns, it could be very abstract, but you could use those patterns for downstream robotics tasks in interesting ways. So, so with that, I'd love to actually like end it here. This is like, I know I, know I kind of like left the second, second take very like open-ended. But if any of these directions are things that you guys are excited about, feel free to stop by, happy to chat about any of them. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Just want to make sure I'm understanding the low probability aspect of the training data. So when you have your first operator execute the task, the high probability is going to be the most common way they did the task. So then does your first operator set what is normal for all the future operators? Yeah, so the way we looked at that was actually we already had an existing data set, and they were both adding, honestly, to that data set. Uh, but you could imagine that you're, you're, you collect a bunch of data from your first operator, and then everything is anchored around that first operator. Like here, like, yeah, we want to just reproduce a work from Berkeley. So we had data from Berkeley people. And then we were trying to like, add to that, and it was just like, failing. But uh, yeah, like, it, you might imagine having an existing data set and really like, anchoring things around that and thinking about what type of coverage your existing data has. So as you're collecting more data, how you could get better generalization or how you could get better, better coverage or state diversity given that existing data set. Uh, thank you for the talk. Can you go back to the Voltron results? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. I'm curious what you think are some of the next steps for bridging this uh, efficiency, maybe task rate. Like, you're, you're demonstrating improvement, but how can we get above 90%? I know, right? Yeah. Like better data, maybe using some of the techniques you talk about, or should we use something like. Uh, I think that's a great question. And that gets at that adaptation phase, because in general, if you think about like a single model, that a single like unified model that's getting like all possible data, it's going to average them out. Like it's going to be 50% goes towards the item. Sure, it's going to help with generalization. I'm excited about that. If you add more distractors, maybe you would realize that, oh, these are distractors. I shouldn't pay attention to them. But in terms of actually doing the task like zero shot or few shot, it would be really hard to just rely on that single model. So, so I think adaptation plays a huge role. And in kind of like this uh, second follow-up work, the, the droid work, and also a paper called like Octo, uh, we are looking at like adaptation here. So, so, so the idea is 
how do you do co-training, right? I collect some data in domain, and then I have this giant model, and then like, what is the right balance of co-training that could actually get, get me to like a higher, higher performance? Um, you could imagine doing RL on top of it. So like, okay, this is gonna be only like 70% successful. How do I do reinforcement learning on top of it to close the loop? You could imagine doing in-context learning. So, so we have these Gemini models with one million contexts now. So you could imagine just like passing in like uh, an example in context and, and getting like that performance through in-context learning. So there are many different approaches to think about adaptation. I do think the way to address this is potentially through adaptation and thinking about that adaptation a little more carefully. But yeah, zero shot, I don't expect having like super high performance, honestly. Uh, er, earlier in the talk, you had a slide that talked about densely narrated uh, training data. Uh -huh. How densely narrated is densely narrated? So you mean for Ultron, like the narrations that we had? No, there was a, I can't remember. It was earlier, mm -hmm. like pretty early in the talk. Yeah, so, so in Ultron, for example, we looked at like language generations, and these were existing data sets that, that just talk about like the goal, so like pick up like Coke can, like, like that is that is the, the level of detail. It's actually not super dense. We have a recent work in collaboration, Sunil has been working, one of the students, has been working on a recent collaboration with folks at Google where it's much denser, where you're looking at not just pick up Coke can or pick up the microphone, you might say move down, move a little bit to the right, move towards the microphone. And then it turns out that if you have like these more detailed like language, uh, like more fine-grained language motions, you would be able to get a lot more generalization because you kind of like understand like the idea of move down from this task and you could apply it for some other task that requires move down. So having more denser language requires, it's more difficult to get that labeling, but it actually like helps quite a bit with generalization.